Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. They say ignorance is bliss, and I have to agree. Before the following incident occurred, I was happy and carefree. I spent my spare time hiking and camping and loved being outdoors. Since the following occurred, I'm afraid to go into the woods alone. What used to be a place of peace and relaxation has become a recurrent setting for my nightmares. My only saving grace is a woman. A woman of another species, sure, but a woman nonetheless. She is a woman with all the motherly instincts of any human mother I know, and the reason I am alive today to tell my tale. As time moves on, I begin to wonder if there are others like her out there. Is the dark filled with monsters and one lone diminutive hero, or is she one of many creatures dedicated to protecting those weaker than herself? The nightmares are occurring less often than they used to. As scared as I am to venture back into the woods, I also want to see her one more time and thank her for all of her help. I found other people like me, people that have seen the monsters and lived to tell the tale. We are discussing the idea of going back out there and trying to learn more about them, trying to find proof so others will believe us and not go out there unprepared. I'm still scared, but if there are enough of us, I just might go. We'll see. For now, the best I can offer is my personal account. I hope you listen to this and believe me. If you heed my words, it just might save your life. The monsters are real. It was my last spring break before graduating from college and getting a real job. I felt the impending loss of freedom knowing that soon I would not have summers and regular breaks during the school year to do with as I pleased. I wanted to revel in the last moments of true freedom and choose the perfect destination to do so. The forest at Bluff Creek has always been a favorite camping destination of mine. Never have I felt more at peace and free than when I'm surrounded by the chaos of the forest. I know most people wouldn't consider a forest chaotic, but most people don't really pay attention to anything going on around them. I love to lay on the forest floor and just listen. The first thing I usually hear is the sound of birds calling each other and screeching at predators. Listen closer and you will hear a cacophony of insects. You can hear the wind rustling through the leaves and the occasional crackle of an animal's foot padding on the forest floor. Depending on where you are at, you might be able to hear the harmonic babble of water winding away to its eventual destination. My point is, the forest is a very loud and chaotic place. In society, we like to see straight lines and organization. Our streets run north to south, east to west. Stores have row after perfectly straight row of goods to choose from. We keep our food in the kitchens and our clothes in the closet. Everything has a place. The forest is different. Things grow as they grow and lay where they lay. Nature has a mind of its own. It follows the path of least resistance sometimes, and other times breaks its way through an impossible situation. The day had finally arrived. My professor bid us farewell, and I raced to my car. The woods were calling me, and my car was already packed. If I drove quickly, I should make it to my first campsite with just enough light to make camp. As expected, I arrived made the quick hike to my first campsite, and made camp quickly. I lay in my tent and was lulled to sleep, quickly by the song of the forest. I slept well, 
snug in my sleeping bag with the chill of the night air on my face being out there among the trees away from the rush and ruckus of civilized life i am always overcome by a calm and quiet peacefulness my dreams mirrored this peacefulness until the early hours of the morning ripped from the utopia of my dreams i awoke with the start i didn't know why but my heart was racing and my breaths were rushed and ragged i was scared i lay there and listened to the night all was quiet and i tried to convince myself that there was nothing to be afraid of then it hit me it was quiet not in the usual forest kind of way where quiet signifies a lack of human noises it was actually quiet no owls hooted in the distance no insects chirped it was deathly quiet all of a sudden i heard what sounded like a large tree branch breaking followed by a heavy thump i lay there not daring to make a sound after a while the night slowly returned to its usual symphony and i drifted back to sleep knowing that whatever danger had been there was no longer a threat i awoke in the morning to a strange sight there was a large tree branch as big around as my leg sticking straight up out of the ground directly in front of my tent door as i made my breakfast i wondered how it had gotten there i decided to chalk it up to complete and random chance the ground was very soft as it had been a wet spring so far the tree branch must have broken off a tree and landed just right in the soft earth to bury itself and remain upright looking back i knew this wasn't the truth but i had no other way to explain it the day's hike was uneventful i hiked along daydreaming about my next destination where i would spend the remainder of my break it was a beautiful spring with a rocky overhang that rocky overhang was the perfect place to sit and watch the wildlife come and refresh themselves and not be seen around midday i reached my destination and began to set up camp a short way from the spring soon i was done and i began gathering wild plants to add to the dried food i brought for my dinner as i was gathering my food i would occasionally hear something large moving through the forest but i never saw anything that wasn't completely unusual but what struck me as odd was that as i moved around it seemed that whatever creature was making these noises moved with me i spent as much time as i could throughout my life in these woods and most of the large animals i encountered really just wanted to be left alone i had never had one follow me around it was also disconcerting that no matter how hard i tried i couldn't catch a glimpse of the creature i finished gathering food and made it back to my campsite to prepare my meal it was easy to forget all about the large animal that was probably still watching me as i began to fill my grumbling belly although the situation struck me as odd if the animal had any ill intentions it would have made a move by now so i quietly ate and enjoyed the wildlife around me once i finished eating i cleaned up the area and carefully tied my food bag into a tree to keep bears away from my stash although i had a tent set up i grabbed my sleeping bag and made the short trip to the spring i wanted to lay on the rocky overhang and stare at the stars for a while i lay there and let my mind wander completely at peace and thinking of nothing in particular i was soon lulled to sleep by the sound of the spring and the tranquility of the space my dreams began and i imagined myself exactly as i was laying out in the open and simply observing the world around me soon my imagination transported me to the ocean being rocked back and forth gently as my boat danced lightly across the waves suddenly i was jarred awake and came to the sickening realization that the gentle waves of my dream were really the back and forth rocking motion of being carried in a fright i drew a huge breath to scream and was overcome by the stench of death itself 
I could taste the rot and decay on my tongue from breathing in such putrid air. What in the world could carry my grown body like a mother carries a child and put forth such an abominable odor? It was as if the creature had rolled in the carcasses of its old kills as a sort of malodorous perfume. Although the stench was suffocating and made my eyes water, I slowly became more accustomed to it. I began to notice other things. The thick and wiry hair that covered the body of the animal. The immense muscles cradling me against its body. I steeled my courage and opened my eyes to gaze upon this nightmarish creature. The sight of the creature shocked me. What I could see of the body was covered in thick fur that was decidedly longer towards the head. The face was also covered in hair, but it was much shorter and allowed me to see the leathery skin underneath. The nose was flat to its face and the eyes were sunken in. It dawned on me that I was looking at the face of a large primate, yet it was walking on two legs like a man. I was too frightened to make a sound, and my eyes were frozen on the face of this creature carrying me as easily and gracefully as a cook carrying a loaf of bread to the table. This thought brought forth another sickening idea. What if I was the bread that the cook brings to the table? Was I perhaps meant to be this creature's next meal? I shifted uneasily, unable to stay still as the horror of my situation washed over me. When I moved, the creature looked down at me and our eyes met. Fear coursed through my body at that moment, sure that the creature would bash me against a tree or rock now that it knew I was fully conscious. Instead of becoming upset, the creature peered at me with a look between curiosity and affection. A low rumble began in its chest and emerged from its mouth, as a sort of whispered melody. It was soothing and eased my fears almost immediately. I continued to stare and realized that it was singing to me, as a mother sings to a child that has awoken in the middle of the night. The creature continued its melody as it strolled through the woods, seeming to know exactly where it was going. Eventually, I fell back asleep and awoke on a soft bed of leaves and pine needles inside the mouth of a cave. I sat up and looked around, trying to take in my surroundings. Outside, the sun was shining and nothing seemed amiss. The forest was full of wildlife going on about its day, oblivious to my strange predicament. I brought my attention to the inside of the cave and was puzzled by the sight before me. Just a few feet from where I lay was a similar bed of leaves and pine needles considerably larger than any human would ever need. Further back in the cave was a pile of something I stood and walked over to see what it was. Orbs of dark red and purple were carefully piled high, and I soon realized that these were berries that had been dried in the sun like a raisin. Next to it was a smaller pile of brightly colored fresh berries. Further back in the cave was a small collection of dried fish skewered to a large and pointed spear-like stick. I was going to explore further when I noticed a shadow where the sun's ray had just moments before shone through. I turned and watched as the creature from the night before walked into the cave carrying two large rabbits in its hands. I sat there paralyzed, and the creature seemed to not even notice that I was there. It turned and sat facing the sun and began to toil. Curious, I slowly walked up to see what it was doing. When I was halfway to the creature, it stopped, turned, and stared at me. I froze in place, unsure whether to continue the short journey, stay where I was, or move back further in the cave. The creature grunted not a harsh or intimidating noise, and motioned towards an area close to where it was sitting. I slowly made my way to the area indicated and sat down in the sun-warmed rock. The creature, which was easily distinguishable as a female in the daylight, was busy skinning and preparing the rabbit to eat. She placed the extra carcass in front of me and motioned for me to grab it. I didn't know what to do, so I simply stared at it. She reached over and, with a sharp claw, 
made a small slit in the skin and motioned for me to do the same. I sat there, knowing that I was not able to do the same. She gave an irritated grunt and motioned for me to grab the rabbit. Fearful of upsetting her, I grabbed the rabbit and pretended to cut the skin with my fingers. She saw through my ruse and began to get upset. I needed to show her that I was trying and quickly. Although so far gentle with me, arousing the ire of this mammoth would not fare well for me. I held up my hand and showed my neatly trimmed fingernail, obviously unable to complete the task at hand. She stared at me for a moment, and I was afraid that what must look like an obvious disfigurement in her eyes would strain this peculiar relationship that we had. Her reaction was pure curiosity. She gently grabbed my hand and pulled it toward herself, getting a closer look at these hands that must look so strange to her. After a long visual inspection, she ran the pads of her fingers on the tips of my fingernails. The noise she then emitted can only be described as a laugh, although a more guttural and primal than any laugh I've heard before. She then let go of my hand, grabbed the rabbit she gave me, and prepared them both. When she was done with the gory task, she handed me one and brought the other to her mouth. Although nothing should have surprised me at this point, I let out a sort of groan of disgust. She stopped and looked at me quizzically, then grabbed the rabbit in my hand and attempted to raise it to my lips. I turned my head to the side to indicate to her that I would not eat it. I immediately regretted this decision as a look of sadness washed over her face. It seemed as if this magnificent living thing was capable of the same emotions I was. She was trying to be nice to me, and I was refusing her gift. I knew in a split second what I needed to do. I set down my rabbit and gently grabbed the rabbit from her hand and placed them on the ground. I stood and beckoned for her to follow me. Curious as to what I was doing, she obliged, and we walked out of the cave. I looked around and saw a ledge with rocks that were just the right size, about four inches tall and wide and scrambled over to them and began picking them up. I could only carry a few at a time, but my companion was able to grab great arm loads, and the task was finished with only one load. We carried them back to the mouth of the cave, and I began to place the rocks in a tight circle. She saw what I was doing and helped me to complete the task. Once we were done, she grabbed both rabbits and handed me one to eat. I accepted the offering and set it down by the circle of stones and motioned for her to do the same. Still curious, she obliged and followed me back out of the cave and into the woods, where I began to gather small sticks. She watched for a moment and then grabbed a great log with one hand and showed it to me. It was then I realized how truly strong she was. She was holding a log with one arm that would easily require two strong men to pick up. Careful to not upset this unfathomably strong beast, I smiled and showed her the size of a stick I was collecting. She seemed confused, so I gently placed my hand on the log and pushed down. She obliged and set it down. Then I handed her a stick and motioned to a similarly sized stick on the ground. She seemed to understand, and soon we had more firewood than we would need for the task at hand. Before we left, I grabbed a handful of dried grass and leaves from the forest floor, and placed them in my pocket. She stared at this curiously. I can only imagine that she must have thought that this strange creature before her came equipped with pockets inside of its strange-looking skin. We returned to the cave, and I placed some of the kindling from my pocket in the center of the rock circle. I then began placing the sticks in the circle, forming a teepee over the kindling and leaving a small opening to the kindling for me to light with it. She watched, mesmerized and curious, as to what I was doing. I then removed my flint strike kit from my pocket and proceeded to make a small spark. She arose with fright and began to bellow as if I were practicing black magic and backed up until her back was pressed against the wall of the cave. I smiled and held my hands in a sign of surrender, hoping that my apparent ease in the situation and friendly nature would allow her to return her to her previously curious state. Although she stayed at the wall of the cave, I saw her body relax. 
I waited for a few moments, but then held the flint and striker out for her to see. You could almost see the internal debate dance across her eyes before she tentatively took a step toward me. Soon, she held out her hand as I placed what must have seemed like an alien device into her hand. She held them for a moment before bringing them closer to her face and examining them. She looked them over carefully, then smelled them, and then gently ran her finger over them, trying to understand what it was she held in her hand. I motioned for her to strike them together, and, hesitantly, she obliged. Harmlessly, a spark emitted, and she seemed satisfied that, whatever this was, it was not going to harm her. She handed me back the tools, and I once again attempted to light the fire. After a few tries, the spark landed perfectly on the dry tender, and I quickly set down my tools and began to blow gently to coax it into a small flame. At first, there was only smoke and the glow of heat, but... In short order, a small flame emerged. I carefully added more kindling until the flame was tall enough to lick the firewood above it. With a few more minutes of coaxing, I had made a good cooking fire. I grabbed a large stick that I had brought back with me and skewered the rabbit to it. She came and sat beside me and was going to stick her hand in the fire, but I quickly placed my hand on her arm and shook my head no. She seemed to understand well enough what I was trying to say and put her arm back down at her side. I pointed to another stick I had kept from the fire and the other rabbit she had brought. She mimicked what I had done, and once she had completed her task, I carefully began to cook my rabbit over the open flame. She followed suit, and several times during the cooking process, she tried to remove her rabbit from the fire and eat it. Each time I motioned for her to put it back and she obliged. Finally, the meat was cooked through and we pulled it out of the fire. I can only imagine how strange this was to her. I'm sure she was used to catching her prey and immediately consuming it if she was hungry. Her impatience finally got the better of her and she tried to take a large bite of her meal. She bellowed and threw the rabbit down and began blowing hard out of her mouth. I smiled at her to calm her down, and after a few minutes, I tentatively tore a small piece of meat from mine and placed it in my mouth. It was the perfect temperature, and I began to eat more greedily. Cautiously this time, she placed her food in her mouth, and almost immediately she moaned with delight and ate ravenously. I couldn't help myself and laughed at her enthusiasm. She stopped and stared at me for a moment, then began to laugh as well. As I laughed, the seriousness of my predicament melted away, and I relaxed as if I was simply sharing a campfire joke with old friends. We enjoyed the rest of the meat in comfortable silence, and when she was done, she got up and walked toward the back of the cave and emerged with two handfuls of berries, one for each of us. Knowing that her enormous size would require far more food than mine, and the fact that I was starting to get full, I handed her the rest of my rabbit and began to casually pop berries into my mouth. She happily finished my meat and her berries along with the rest of my berries once I was completely stuffed. We laid there for a bit, resting and letting our food digest, and then she stood up and motioned for me to follow. On the way out, she grabbed a dingy-looking backpack and headed out the door. This gave me pause. What was she doing with a backpack? She obviously hadn't gone to the store to pick one out, or ordered one online, and had it delivered to her little cave. She had been so nice to me up until now. Surely, she was incapable of harming a human. Perhaps a hiker had left this backpack when he left this paradise to return to civilized life. That excuse didn't really make sense. Who would leave their backpack out in the middle of the woods? But... It was the best scenario I could come up with that didn't fill me with dread, so I clung to it like a lifeboat. She hiked through the woods and I followed behind. I tried to look left and right to take in the scenery around me, but my eyes kept wandering back to what was right in front of me. The backpack slung across the shoulder of this mammoth beast. It was both terrifying and endearing at the same time. Our hike was a long one 
and despite my intentions otherwise, I found myself focusing on any details the backpack could provide. Although dingy, faded, and covered with a fine layer of dirt, I could make out that this was once a very fine accessory. Considering myself an outdoorsman, I know a thing or two about backpacks. This pack wasn't the standard beginning of the school year supply you could find on discount at a department store. This was a specialized hiking pack, the kind that one would have to save up for. I inspected it as best as I could from a distance, and determined that there were no rips or tears other than the dirt that encrusted it, and the fading from sitting in the elements was in perfect order. Surely, this wasn't discarded by some forgetful hiker. It would have been a prized possession. Before my thoughts turned any darker, we arrived at our destination. My thoughts quickly faded when I saw the scene before me. We were in a small clearing, and the sun shone through and warmed my back. All around me, bushes were filled with brightly colored berries, ripe for the picking. As I stepped forward, I caught a glimpse of a rabbit hop off into hiding. Bees and butterflies darted back and forth around the bushes, and I could hear songbirds whistling about their day high in the trees. I looked at her, and she smiled at my awe of this almost sacred place. She pulled the pack from her shoulder and walked over to the bushes and began to pick the ripe berries and place them into her pack. I followed suit, and soon we had a nice collection to take back to the cave. We began the long walk back, but we took a different route, and soon came to a lake. The lake was equally as pristine as the clearing we were just in. She stopped at the shore and gingerly set down the backpack. She then walked over to the edge of the wood and grabbed a stick. On her way back to the lake, she stopped to pick up a sharp rock, and then sat down by the shore and proceeded to make a crude spear. I watched entranced by her work and soon she was done and slowly wading into the shallows of the lake it wasn't long before she thrust the stick down and brought it back up having speared a fish she let the fish thrash for a moment and then removed it from the spike and unceremoniously onto the shoreline she gestured toward it and i took it to mean that she wanted me to fetch her prize i did so then tied it to a line i found inside of the backpack I then placed the fish and the line back into the water to keep it cool and secured the other end of the line under a large rock. This continued for a while, and I forgot all about the fear and dread that the backpack had previously given me. When she felt we had caught enough, she tossed the stick up onto the shore, and with a great wail of joy, she dove into the water and emerged in the center of the lake and cheerily beckoned for me to come in. The day had become quite warm. A nice swim did sound good, so I jumped in. We played and swam, enjoying the coolness of the water and the heat of the sun. When we were done, we laid out on a large rock and let the sun dry us off. She dozed off quickly, and I decided to do the same. When we awoke, it was late afternoon. I was concerned that we wouldn't make it back to the cave in time, so I made a quick fire and we had a nice meal of fish and berries. When we were done, she grabbed the pack and started to walk away. Confused, I tried to get her to sit back down, but she insisted that we leave. I got up and followed behind her closely this time. The waning sunlight had me concerned that I would lose my guide if she got too far in front of me. As we were walking, I heard the noise of wood knocking on wood. Immediately, I remembered hearing this noise on my hike to my first campsite. Suddenly, the joy and delight of my day was gone. I remembered that I had been kidnapped by this friendly giant. When she heard the noise, she turned and looked at me, but her usual happy expression had been tainted with a hint of fear. She motioned for me to come and began to move much more quickly along the path. I tried as best I could, but the distance between us was slowly growing. She turned to check on me and circling back to grab my hand and pull me along the trail. No matter how hard I tried, I could not keep up her pace. I stumbled and she dragged me several feet before she realized it and stopped to help lift me from the ground. We continued at this frenzied pace, her tireless and me losing strength and stamina by the second, until we heard a sharp cry to our left. At this point, she slung me over her shoulder like I weighed nothing and took off at a dead sprint through the woods. 
during this uncomfortable journey, I heard the same sharp cry behind us. Then to our right and once again to our left. By now, she was in a sheer state of panic, and what I assumed at first to be a dead sprint held nothing to the pace she was now keeping. As we raced to our destination, I continued to hear these sharp cries, now seeming to surround us. Each cry seemed to fuel her frenzied pace, and when we arrived at the cave, she unceremoniously dumped me onto the floor, stood at the mouth of the cave, and let forth a roar that blanketed every inch of me in icy terror. She turned and faced me, and pointed frantically at the fire pit we had made earlier that day. I could only assume that she needed a fire, so I gathered the wood we hadn't used that morning and tried to light a fire. My fear made the task difficult, and once again she roared as if trying to scare away a predator intent on her destruction. In the distance, I heard a similar but deeper roars echoing back into the cave. It only took a split second to realize that this wasn't her voice echoing back. It was the roar of our pursuers. It was then that I realized if I didn't pull it together, we were in serious trouble. The old adage, slow is fast, echoed through my brain, and I managed to take a deep breath and clear my mind. I opened my eyes and calmly lit the fire. Once the light of the fire was bright, she visibly relaxed, but remained at the mouth of the cave, staring into the distance as if her eyes could pierce the darkness and see movements of her would-be attackers. Occasionally, we would hear the knock of wood on wood or the sharp cry heard during our pursuit, but they were fading into the distance. After a while, the sounds were gone. Despite my best efforts, I drifted off to sleep. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to... Just kidding. April Fools. If you thought I was gonna do you dirty and leave you guys on a cliffhanger, I got you. Leave a comment down below letting me know if you fell for my little April Fools prank. All right, let's get back and finish this amazing encounter. I awoke to the noise of rocks being moved around. I looked over and she was piling rocks the size of basketballs into a mound at the left side of the mouth of the cave. I sat up and she turned to look at me. She seemed both happy and sad at the same time, as if something wonderful was taking place and yet it would soon come to an end. She walked over to me and gently touched my head as she passed into the back of the cave. She returned with some dried fish and berries, and we ate a solemn meal. As soon as it was over, she motioned for me to follow, and we walked to an area with many fallen branches and proceeded to collect more firewood. She would occasionally stop and turn her head in one direction or another. I can only assume she was looking and listening to see if the previous night's pursuers were in the area. We gathered great armloads of wood and took it back to the cave. We returned to the woods and this time she began picking up long and mostly straight sticks slightly smaller in diameter than a petite woman's wrist and five to six feet long. I picked up a smaller stick and showed it to her but she took it from my hands and broke it in two, and then handed me one of her larger sticks and pointed to another one on the ground. I did not understand what she wanted for them, but I knew what she wanted, so I did as she wished and collected the proper stick. We returned to the cave, and she placed her sticks to the right of the cave mouth, and I did the same. She then walked towards the back of the cave and returned with two sharpened rocks, one larger that fit perfectly in the palm of her hand, and another perfectly sized for mine. She proceeded to pick up a stick and use her rock as a makeshift knife to sharpen the end of the stick to a point. I started to do the same, and then remembered that I had seen a pocket knife in one of the pockets of the backpack we had used yesterday, when I rifled through it to find a line for the fish. I jumped up and ran over to the backpack, and she stared at me as I searched for the knife. I found it and brought it back to our sitting place. She tried to hand me back the rock, and I shook my head no. I then opened the knife, and she let out a short gasp. 
it's probably safe to assume she had no idea that this strange instrument could open. She watched as I used the knife to sharpen the tip of the stick, and she seemed satisfied with my work. She held out her hand, indicating that she wanted to try, and I handed her the knife. Although it was a large pocket knife, it looked like a small toy in her hand, and her dexterity was not great enough to wield such a diminutive tool with skill. She gave up with an exasperated huff and shoved the knife back into my hand, even in her frustration, being careful not to cut me. So we sat side by side in silence until all of the sticks were sharpened and placed in a neat pile upright by the mouth of the cave. By this point in time, I was hungry and walked to the back of the cave to see if there were any more fish. She grabbed my arm to stop me, then walked back to the food area and brought me back a stick that the fish were once on as if to tell me there was no more food. I walked to the front of the cave and slung the backpack over my shoulder, hoping she would understand that I wanted to go collect more food. She grabbed the pack and set it back on the floor and stood in my way as if to tell me that we would not be venturing out again today. I rubbed my stomach, trying to make her understand that I was hungry. She stared at me for a moment like a mother scolding a child, then softened her gaze. She motioned for me to come with her and we walked out of the cave. This time, we circled back behind the cave and went in a different direction than the day before. We came to a grove of massive and ancient trees. She searched the area as if she were looking for the perfect one, and when she found it, she pointed to me and then pointed straight up. Unsure of what she wanted, I stood there and stared quizzically. She then grabbed the rough bark with her hands and used her monstrously large arms to pull herself up. But by my estimates, she was able to pull herself up eight feet higher with each pull. I walked to the tree, much too massive for me to wrap my arms around, and tried to find a foothold. The bark dug into my skin, and after several attempts, I never made it more than a few inches off the ground before sliding back down. She looked at me for a moment, and then grabbed me up with one of her massive arms and bounded me up the tree. I will never understand how she could climb a tree that quickly with only one hand while carrying a full-grown man, and yet she did. And without a moment's hesitation, she seemed to climb that tree just as quickly, holding me as she did. When she was unencumbered by my weight and was able to use two hands, we reached the top of the trunk which split off into several large limbs, leaving a relatively flat space in the center for me to sit and see the ground far below. She made sure that I understood I was to wait there and then took off back down the tree. I sat there and wondered what other options she thought I had. If I couldn't climb up there, I certainly couldn't climb down. The only other option I saw was to jump. At this height, a good outcome of such a fall would be several broken bones, but would likely instead lead to my certain death. I waited for what seemed like a very long time for her to return. During this time, it dawned on me that I was being treated much like a small child, and this perch was the equivalent of a playpen. The tree was babysitting me. On one hand, this revelation made me feel like she wanted to protect me, which was good, but at the same time, I couldn't help but think I wouldn't need her protection if she had left me alone as I slept there on that rocky overhang by the spring. As I was mulling over these two opposing thoughts, she returned. When she jumped up into the opening, I was perched in, I was scared, not having realized she was back at all, let alone climbing up the tree to fetch me. And I scooted backward from the shock. This was the worst thing I could have done, as my roost was relatively flat, but also quite small. I went to put my hand behind me to balance myself, and I was met with air. With a sickening sense of dread, I began to fall, but a large hand shot out and grabbed me. I was saved. All my anger at my kidnapping was gone, and I was awash with relief. I clung to her for a moment before I loosened my grip, at which time she gently cradled me with one arm and descended that treacherous tree and placed me back on the firm ground. After placing me down, she turned and grabbed the day's catch 
two large deer who looked perfectly unharmed except for their wildly rolling heads. It was obvious that she had run them down no small feet when you considered the speed at which deer can run and had snapped their necks. Once again, I was in awe of the strength and speed of this mighty beast and the feat she was capable of. This time, I was not allowed to walk beside her, but instead was forced to share an arm with the two dead deers as she rushed back to our cave. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy venison but being jostled about with their disjointed heads rolling around slapping against my face is not pleasant. But we made the trip in good time, and soon enough I was able to stand on my own two feet and move about of my own volition. She took both of the deer and proceeded to skin and gut them, which, while I made a fire to cook them, I knew we would never eat all of this meat at once. So I used some sticks gathered earlier that day and some thin rope I found in the backpack and created a standing grate of sorts to place the meat on and let it dry out close enough to the fire to dry but not so close as to roast it. Satisfied with my handiwork, I used the knife to slice off long strips of meat and placed them on the drying rack. I then skewered meat and placed it over the fire to cook for that evening's meal. All the while, she sat at the mouth of the cave, staring into the distance. When it was time to eat, I brought our food to her and sat down beside her to stare out into the wilderness. The sun was gone, but the last of its rays still clung on. I knew that soon the woods would be plunged into darkness, the only light being the fire that I would keep burning throughout the night. As I predicted before, I had even finished eating. The sun's rays were extinguished by the blanket of night. Usually, I like to be out in nature when night came, but tonight, it filled me with dread. What would the night hold? I took my position by the fire, unsure of what I should do, but certain that these magical flames somehow helped protect me. I stared into the fire for hours, occasionally throwing in more wood to keep it going. It was very late or very early, depending on how you looked at it, and she had not moved, keeping an untiring watch over me and the cave. As I thought about it, I realized that she couldn't have had more than a few hours of sleep since my abduction, and I felt sorry for her. She shouldn't have taken me, but since that time, she had done nothing but take care of me. I walked up to her and tried to motion for her to lay down in her bed. She huffed and refused, but I pressed on. She needed sleep, and it appeared that nothing was going to happen tonight. I urged her once again, and she seemed to understand what I was trying to say. She couldn't protect me if she was exhausted. She gave one last good long stare into the darkness, and turned to me. After a thoughtful glance, she walked past me and lay on her bed and immediately fell into a deep sleep. I continued to stare into the darkness, keeping watch against the unknown. Occasionally, I would return to the fire and place more wood on it. Its flames gave me great comfort, and I trusted its protection more than my ability to see through the inky blackness outside to distinguish friend from foe and tree from predator. As the night grew colder, I inched closer and closer to the fire to keep warm. I soon became very tired and kept dozing off only to jerk back awake as my head began to fall. I walked over to her and tried to gently nudge her awake, but she was so exhausted that my nudgings did nothing to wake her, and she continued to sleep peacefully. I walked back to my post and quickly remembered how cold the night air was. I slid back toward the fire until I was sufficiently warm and tried my best to stay awake. Having heard... No cries or wood-knocking sounds over the last 24 hours, I found it difficult to let my fear keep me awake. My fear had leaked away long ago and was replaced by the primal need for sleep. No matter how hard I tried, I could not fight it and fell asleep resting against the rocks she had piled earlier beside the cave mouth. I woke up with my senses prickling. I looked over and saw her still sleeping peacefully, but I knew something was wrong. The fire was almost out. Was that what was making me feel on edge? I grabbed some sticks and threw them on the fire and was suddenly overcome by a terrible stench. I had gotten used to her scent, but this was something different. 
The undertones were the same, but this had a muskiness to it that hers lacked. I turned quickly but saw nothing. I crept slowly and quietly toward the mouth of the cave. The stench was almost overwhelming now. I heard a soft growl to my right and saw her in a crouched position in front of the bed she was sleeping on. I turned my head and saw her crouched beside and just behind me. She must have smelled it too. She looked at me and motioned for me to get to the back of the cave. Before I could turn around, a large creature who made my companion look like a child jumped into the mouth of the cave directly in front of me. I am not certain whether it was a fright or if I was physically knocked backward by his terrible stench, but I found myself on the ground scrambling backward as fast as I could to escape this terrible monster. Where I saw kindness in my ally's eyes, in his I saw nothing but hate. I continued to pull myself backward into the cave, unable to break the stair between us. Suddenly, faster than I could have ever imagined, she leaped from her spot and straight onto the monster's back. She wrapped her legs around him like a vice and, with a scream, tore into his flesh with razor-sharp claws and teeth. He bellowed and tried to toss her from his back, but it was no use. He tried to reach around behind himself to grab her, but he couldn't see to get a good grasp. For a moment, I thought he would try to run away, leaving her free to jump off his back in the dark woods and scramble her way back to the cave. Instead, he turned and slammed his back against the wall of the cave, with her sandwiched between the stone and massive body. She continued her assault, and he slammed her against the wall. This time, she began to loosen her grip on him and slide down toward the ground. Although I was afraid for my life, I knew inaction would surely cause a dreadful end for my companion and myself. I rushed forward, grabbed a stick from the fire, and thrust the burning end into the monster's face. The creature screamed with fear and pain and stumbled backward, tripping over my ally in the process. She was coming back around from her last blow and stood up on shaky legs, while the monster lay on the ground, scratching at his face and thrashing around in pain. She grabbed one of the round rocks from the mouth of the cave and smashed it into the face of the monster. He stopped howling and twitching for a moment before letting a long sigh escape from what was left of his torn and blistered lip. His whole body shuddered, then relaxed. She fell to her knees and ripped open his stomach. She then thrust her hand in through his stomach and up into his chest cavity. She ripped out his heart. And, with a sharp cry like those heard the night before, she posed in front of the mouth of the cave and ripped great chunks out of his still beating heart with her teeth. Blood dripped down her face and chest. She gave one more cry before tossing the heart into the darkness, beyond and beating her chest as if to signify her victory. I breathed a sigh of relief, feeling that danger had now passed, when I heard the knock of wood on wood and realized that the lone attacker wasn't so alone after all. The knocks grew more and more distant, and with a cry that could barely be heard because of the great distance between us and them, she turned and sat down to collect herself from the gruesome battle. Seeing her at ease, I felt safe to return to my resting spot. As I tried to relax, I couldn't help but watch the scene before me. She used her sharpened rocks to hack off what was left of the monster's head and then place it just outside the mouth of the cave. She then used her sharp claws to skin the beast with ease. She took the skin and using a few large rocks to hold it down, created a gruesome curtain that covered half of the cave's opening. She then took the head and impaled it onto the dull end of one of the sticks we had sharpened and shoved the sharp end forcefully into a crack in the rock at the cave's entrance. Pleased with her redecorating, she turned and looked first at the bloody and lifeless demon that lay on the ground, and then at the fire. She walked over to our drying rack, removed the now dry deer meat, and placed it in the food area. She then began to slice long pieces of his flesh and placed them in the drying rack. I was sickened by the act. He had just attacked us. And if we hadn't killed him first, he surely would have murdered us. But they were the same, despite his enormity, 
They shared the same facial features and the same hair covered their body. Even their stench shared a certain quality, and the similarities made it undeniable that they were the same species. Yet, here she was, filleting his flesh and spreading it out to cook as if he were any other game animal she had brought home for dinner. I was repulsed by the act. This creature shared emotions with me, and in truth, a striking resemblance to early man. And yet, she didn't understand the principle that higher-minded creatures do not eat their own. I could forgive the ripping out of the heart. I could even forgive the bite she took out of primal rage. She was, of course, a wild animal, even if she seemed to live on a higher plane of consciousness than the other wildlife you would expect to find out in the woods. I could forgive her use of the skin and skull at the opening of the cave. Those were definitely being used as warnings to any other would-be attackers. But this was different. This was a calm and thought-out decision, and she seemed to not be bothered by the task. On the contrary, she seemed to be enjoying herself. The more I watched her, the more repulsed I became, until I could stand it no more and rushed out of the cave and gave my dinner back to the wilderness. When I was done heaving, I turned around and she was behind me, looking sad, and she reached out to me as if to comfort me. Exhausted from the long day, lack of sleep, and terror I had just lived through, I almost took her up on her offer, but as I drew closer to her, I could see that she was still slick and dripping with his blood. The sight of her disgusted me. I wanted to be thankful for her protection, but at that moment, I could only see a base creature driven only by primal urges. I turned my head away from her and stomped back into the cave. She followed behind me, timidly, and took her place by the fire. I lay down in my makeshift pallet of leaves and pine needles and turned my back to her, intent on ignoring her for as long as possible. I heard a soft whimper and rolled over, only to see her apparently crying. What was wrong with me? She had done nothing but protect me, and here I was, angry with her. Of course, she couldn't understand what she had done wrong, because she had done nothing. I sat up, and she looked over at me, quickly drying her eyes. I smiled, stood up, and walked over to her. I sat down beside her and rested my head against her. She sighed and gently wrapped her arm around me, and I fell asleep in her arms. I woke up the next morning on my bed, and she was nowhere to be found. I waited for a time, and then decided that just sitting there wasn't going to help anything. I thought about venturing outside, but I felt so much safer in the cave. What could I do to help inside the cave? The fire was almost out, so I threw some more sticks in, careful to walk over the pooled blood from the monster that had trickled out into the cave floor and collected in the shallow divots that littered the floor of the cave. I straightened the pile of sticks and then decided to check on our food supply. It was dark back there, so I decided to use one of the burning sticks as a torch to light my way. Upon inspection, it was apparent we had weeks worth of food, although I shuddered at the thought of eating something that so closely resembled a human. The light from my torch showed me that the cave was much deeper than I realized. I walked back further and found a small cavern off to the right. When I walked in, I was appalled at what I saw. Lined up around the edges of the cavern were the sun-bleached skeletons of very large creatures. Upon closer inspection, it was safe to assume that these skeletons were all the same species as my loyal protector. I stepped closer and picked up one of the giant bones. It was much thicker than a human's and extremely heavy. I placed it down and picked up a skull. The back of the skull was bashed open, showing the thickness of the cranium. It was easily a half inch thick, and I wondered what kind of force would be required to do this kind of damage to bones this thick. I looked around the room, and it appeared that all of these animals had been dispatched in a similar fashion, with a heavy blow to the head. Why would she kill this many of her own kind, and if she didn't, why would she find the carcasses of her dead kin and bring them back to this haphazard city of the dead? I looked a little further into the cavern and found a fresh skeleton, headless with bits of meat still clinging to it. This must be the attacker from last night. As I was turning to leave, the light from my torch glinted back at me from the rear of the cavern. 
I walked in the direction of the glint, and what I saw next terrified me and paralyzed every cell in my body. There, laid out straight with arms at his side, was the partially decomposed corpse of a man. He wore a leather-banded watch. The glint must have been from the glass on the face of the watch. He had on a pair of thick khaki-colored pants and a red jacket. On his feet were a pair of khaki and green hiking boots. I stared in disbelief for an eternity, trying to comprehend what I was seeing. The skin on his face and hands had a malted gray look. Where his chest should have protruded higher than his stomach, it was sunken in as if smashed by a great boulder. Could she have done this? I didn't want to believe it. But I had seen firsthand her ability to steal the life from another with just a rock. Just beyond the light of the fire, I saw something else. And without realizing what I was doing, I took a few steps forward. There was another body. This one more decomposed, lying in a small pool of putrid liquid that was leaking from the body. The clothes were wet with this filthy secretion and were ripped and torn as if this poor soul had run through barbed wire. What I could see through the scraps of his shredded shirt proved that the shirt was on his body when it was ripped. His stomach cavity had become a cesspool of putrefied liquid with chunks of what I can only imagine was one internal organs floating in it. I wish I could describe for you the clothing he wore, but everything was covered. I did see a gold chain around his neck that had somehow survived the onslaught of whatever had killed him. I looked closer, and the gold chain was a pendant of St. Christopher. I wondered at the irony of the situation. A hiker who prayed to St. Christopher for protection was laying in the middle of nowhere, rotting inside of a cave. Still in shock, I took a few steps further, into the outshoot of the cavern, and saw one final human body. This one was mostly liquefied, with bones showing through the bits of flesh that remained. I stumbled backward to the wall of the outshoot and fell into a sitting position. The shock was just too much. Why would there be three human bodies? Did she kill them? Did she find them? The questions ran through my mind as I sat there in stunned silence. After a while, my thoughts turned from confused to angry. Was this to be my fate? Had I survived the past few days only to be later killed and cast aside like a doll that she had grown tired of? My anger reached a boiling point, and I stood up and stormed out of the cavern to the front of the cave. When I returned to the front room, I grabbed a sharpened stick and waited for her to return. Although she was a wild creature, she was capable of thoughts and communicated well enough I was going to get answers. I hid in a small cleft beside the cave opening. She returned to the cave carrying two fresh fish and a handful of greens and tubers. Once she passed me, I jumped out behind her. She turned to see the pointed stick in her direction. She was confused. She took a step toward me, and I jabbed the stick in her direction. She jumped backward and stared at me with a mix of confusion and hurt. I pointed towards the back of the cave, but she didn't budge. I took a step toward her and used the stick to push her in the direction I wanted her to go in. She knew what I wanted. She hung her head, turned, and marched solemnly toward the cavern. When we walked in, she stopped and slowly scanned the walls lined with the dead. She didn't look triumphant, only determined. I prodded her onward, but she just kept shaking her head no. I jabbed her with the stick, just enough to hurt, but not enough to pierce the thick hide. And she began to cry. I jabbed again, and she walked toward the rear, where the human bodies laid, discarded, rotting, and forgotten. When we got there, I yelled at her and asked her why she did this. She turned and gave me a pleading look with bloodshot eyes. Still, I screamed. I screamed until I couldn't scream any longer. All of the anger, frustration, and fear from the past few days came out in a fit of verbal rage, but she just stood there staring at me. I realized I was getting nowhere. I had a monster in here pretending to be kind. There were monsters out there hunting me. I didn't even know where out there was. I was asleep when she removed me from my campsite. I knew she was capable of traveling great distance relatively quick, and I had no idea how far she had taken me. I was lost, scared, and in the company of monsters, no matter which way I went. I dropped the stick and hung my head in defeat. When I did this, she continued to stare at me until I looked back at her. 
She pointed to the dead bodies, then herself, and shook her head no. She then walked back into the main portion of the cavern, grabbed a skull from one of her kin. She returned, pointed to the skull, and then pointed to the first dead body. Was she trying to tell me that it wasn't her, that a different monster had killed this man? She then pointed at herself and picked up a rock and pretended to smash the skull. I thought about this for a moment. This could be exactly what had happened. After all, I'm positive the creature from the night before would have gladly killed me if she hadn't killed him first. I pointed to the skull and then walked toward the first dead body, motioning if I was going to smash it in the chest. She shook her head yes. I repeated the charade for the other two victims, and both times she shook her head yes. Then I pointed to the skulls and to her. She shook her head yes and acted out hitting it in the head. How could I have ever thought that she was capable of what I was accusing her of? She killed all of these creatures to protect those people. I began to sob from both relief and shame at what I had accused her of. She embraced me with her huge arms and sobbed as well. I knew I was forgiven, and it felt like a huge secret had been tearing us apart and was now gone. After a while, we let go of the embrace and looked at each other. I smiled, and she had regained a twinkle in her eye. As we walked back, I looked at one of the skeletons and muttered the word monster. She turned to look at me and made a soft, guttural noise. I stared at her for a moment, pointed to another skeleton, and said the word monster. She pointed to it and made the same noise. I wondered if she was telling me that she had her own language. I pointed to myself and said human. She made another noise, this one higher pitched with a slight click at the end. I pointed to her. She hung her head and made the same noise she had made when I said monster. We were communicating, but I had hurt her feelings. I went to touch her and said friend. Although she didn't know what the word meant, it seemed to make her happy that my word for her was not the same as the word for all the creatures in the cavern that she had killed in an attempt to protect those poor souls in the back of the cavern. We walked back to the front room of the cave and prepared our meal. As we sat and ate, a horrible thought dawned on me. She had tried and failed to protect the last three humans who had lived with her. Would I fare any better? I pointed to the now congealed blood on the floor and said, Monster. She shook her head, Yes. And then I pointed outside and said, Monster. With a sad face, she once again shook her head. I asked her how many, but she didn't understand what I was trying to say. I sat there for a moment, then grabbed some pebbles that were off to the side of the room. I returned to my seat and placed two pebbles in front of me. I then held up two fingers. I placed a third pebble in front of me and held up three fingers. I repeated, this time with four pebbles and four fingers. Then I looked at her and said monsters and pointed outside and held up one finger. She shook her head no and I held up two fingers. Once again, she shook her head no, so I held up three fingers. She took a deep breath and reached over and grabbed all of the pebbles from my hand. Then she walked over to the edge of the room and grabbed another handful of pebbles. When she returned, she placed them all in a pile in front of me and made the noise that she used for her kind. My mind was reeling. She was trying to protect me from an army. If the size of the creature from the night before was any indication, she wasn't even fully grown yet. I was being protected from an army by a child. My thoughts were soon interrupted when she reached over and nudged me. She encouraged me to finish eating and pointed to me and then the floor. Then she pointed to herself, then toward the woods outside the cave. I nodded yes knowing that going with her would only slow her down in whatever task she had planned. She left me, and I sat there, quietly eating and wondering how I could help in this dire situation. Within just a few minutes, she returned to the mouth of the cave with two more rabbits in her hand. She quickly skinned and gutted them and handed them to me. 
motioning for me to cut them up and put them on the drying rack. Our food stash was quite large after the deer she had killed the day before. I knew she was simply trying to give me something to do, something to make me feel useful, and I was happy for the task. I finished my task and tended to the fire. I wanted to do something, but was afraid to leave the cave. I could think of nothing else to do, so I was stuck sitting there with my thoughts. I was terrified of what the night might hold. Suddenly, I knew what I needed to do. I cautiously crawled to the mouth of the cave. It seemed as if most of these creatures were nocturnal, so I hoped that I wouldn't be seen. I peeked out and saw nothing. I sniffed the air, knowing that if I was downwind from one of these creatures, I would be able to smell it. I saw nothing and smelled nothing, so I walked onto the ledge in front of the cave. What I needed to do was set some traps. I surveyed the area, trying to determine the best way to complete my new task. To the right of the mouth, there was a large, oval opening into black, inky space. The ledge we walked on weaved around this hole, and my monstrous friend always kept the pathway clear of any debris so she wouldn't slip and fall. I searched around until I found some long, thin sticks. After gathering quite a few rocks, I took them back to the hole and laid them across it in a crisscross fashion. I then collected some fallen leaves and carefully covered the sticks making it appear as if the leaves had landed on solid ground. My friend would know not to step in this area. This was her home after all, and she knew its layout, but our attackers just might be fooled. I then wondered what else I could do. I looked around for any other hazards I might exploit. I noticed that there was a small ledge about eight feet long and two feet wide above the mouth of the cave. I sat there, pondering how that could be used to our advantage. I remembered a scene from an old black and white western where the bad guys booby-trapped the entrance to their hideout by propping up logs that would fall on anyone in the doorway if the bad guys pulled a rope. It was crude, but it just might work. I returned to the cave and searched through our supplies until I found some paracord. I cut off four pieces of paracord approximately 20 feet long. I went back outside in search of a sturdy stick. I found one about two inches in diameter and carefully used my knife to cut it into four sections about two feet long. I found another similarly sized stick and repeated. I tied the paracord to the four of the sticks. Then I took my sticks and clambered above the mouth of the cave. I carefully placed two sticks together at the top and far apart at the bottom. The ledge floor created the third side of a triangle. The stick with the paracord attached, I placed closest to the mouth of the cave with the paracord dangling down. There were some palm-sized rock on the ledge, and I used them to help hold my sticks in place. Once I had taken all of the sticks and created four of these sets, I went to work collecting large logs. I carefully placed them behind these sticks, with the sticks preventing these logs from rolling forward and crashing down off the ledge. I continued finding logs and placing them up there on my booby trap. The sun was starting to set, so there was no time to check and see if my trap would work. I just had to hope and pray that when the time came, it would do its job. I was tired and hungry, and with the waning light, there wasn't much more I could do outside. I went inside and got the fire going again. I grabbed some dried meat and berries and sat down to eat. After one bite, I realized just how thirsty I was. I had almost no water all day long. I sat there waiting for her to return, and my growing thirst soon became the only thing I could think of. I rummaged through the cave and found an old canteen without a lid. It wasn't great, but it would have to do. I cautiously edged to the mouth of the cave and looked around. There was a little more light than the night before, but I could still see more than a few feet in front of me. I remembered seeing a small trickle of water going across our path when we went berry hunting and fishing the other day and decided the muddy water was better than no water and walked off in that direction. 
It was hard to see, but I was able to stick to the path and eventually I felt my foot slide a bit in the mud. If I hadn't stepped in it, I would have walked right past it. It was much too dark to be out, but I had to have water. I knelt down and strained my eyes in the darkness to see the trickle of water. As best I could tell, the trickle of water had almost dried up and left just a bit of mud in places. I got on my hands and knees and crawled through the woods, following the trail of mud. Hopefully, I would be able to find the water source and get a drink. As I crawled, the wide open forest quickly gave way to thick and thorny underbrush. I was so thirsty and I'd gone this far I couldn't give up now. I continued crawling, thorns scratching my skin. Soon the thorns began to tear through my shirt and bite into my chest and back. My hair kept getting caught in the underbrush and I wondered if I'd made the right choice. I paused and thought about going back, but the mud trail I was following was getting larger and wetter the further I went. Now, with a pounding headache from dehydration, I knew my only option was to push on. I went a few more feet and stopped to catch my breath and gave my skin a sort of reprieve from the onslaught of the thorns. Sitting there quietly, I heard the faintest bubbling sound. Finally, I was almost there. A few more feet of torture and I found it. The little spring wasn't much to speak of, but it was cold and fresh water. I placed my mouth down on the rock the spring was dribbling from and did my best to lick up the water as it came out. After a few minutes, I pulled the canteen out of my pocket and placed it against the rock to collect as much water as I could. After what seemed like an eternity, the canteen was full and I gulped it down. I filled it back up and drained it once again. I was finally satiated, but I decided to fill it up one more time. Unfortunately, there was no lid to the canteen, and I had no way to take any water with me. So, I needed to drink as much as possible while I was here. As the canteen was filling up, I thought I heard something off in the distance. I laid there, quietly, afraid to move. The sound kept getting louder and louder. When I first heard it, it sounded like a soft rustle of leaves, but rhythmic. As it got closer and closer, I knew it was the sound of something walking. The sound became less rhythmic, and I soon realized that whatever creature it was kept stopping to sniff the air. I could hear it pulling the air in and out of its nose quickly. I wondered if it could smell me. A terrifying thought washed over me. Not only did I smell human, which would surely attract any monster's attention, but I was also covered in a thousand small cuts from the underbrush, all oozing small droplets of blood. If the smell of my sweat didn't bring the monster to my hiding spot, the smell of my blood definitely would. Terrified and knowing I had no chance to hide from a creature who could smell me, no matter how well hidden I was, I stood up and ran for my life. The sound of rustling leaves and sniffing of was immediately replaced by the pounding of feet on the ground. Although some distance off, the creature was quickly gaining on me. I now knew that this wasn't some random forest creature. It was indeed one of the monsters. I was already running as fast as I could, and I was losing my head start quickly. I had to think fast. I couldn't outrun the creature, so I had to outsmart it. As I was running in the dark, I was constantly being slapped with branches and the underbrush tore at my legs. I would soon be caught and I still hadn't come up with any ideas on how to outsmart the monster chasing me. Suddenly, my foot caught on a root and I fell. In the darkness, I didn't realize how close I was to an embankment and when I fell, I tumbled down it. I landed at the bottom sore, bleeding and with a busted ankle. Fear radiated throughout my body, and with a sudden surge of adrenaline, I began crawling around in the dark. I found a small hole and crawled in. I had found a small cave tunnel, barely big enough for me to squeeze into. At the end of the tunnel, there was a small chamber, barely big enough for me to crawl into and turn around in. I managed to squeeze in and turn so that my face was toward the opening. 
Although there was no way I could fight in this position, I also knew that the monster would never be able to fit into the small opening. Within a few seconds of positioning myself, in myself the small bit of light at the end of the tunnel from the moonlight was eclipsed by a large hairy head. My nostrils were assaulted by the stench of the monster that was chasing me. He sat there, screaming in frustration, knowing that he would never be able to reach me. His screams were answered by other streams in the distance. The infernal army of monsters knew where I was. Although I knew I was safe in the small hole, the thought of an entire army of monsters waiting for me outside terrified me. I was paralyzed with fright, but it didn't matter. Even if I had my full faculties there, there wasn't anything I could do but just lay there and wait. But what was I waiting for? They couldn't get in, but I couldn't get out without facing certain death. The small chamber I was in and the tunnel were made of stone. There was only one way in and one way out. There were no supplies. I couldn't stay there indefinitely. My only hope was that my friend, who so closely resembled these monsters, would realize the predicament I was in and find a way to save me. Even then, though, what could she really do? It was her against an army. As my terrifying thoughts were trying to find some kind of hope to cling to, I was torn back to the reality by a new threat. Something was slowly, inch by inch, working its way into the tunnel. I had assumed that all the monsters were massive. It had never crossed my mind that they, of course, also had children. I could barely see, as the body of the monster came closer and closer, occasional streams of moonlight would pierce the inky blackness around its body. The occasional streaks of light showed me that the creature was getting closer and closer. Although terrified, I knew I needed to do something quickly. I checked my pockets. I had nothing. I didn't even have the canteen anymore. I dropped that when I was running. I blindly thrust my hand about the floor of the tiny chamber, hoping to find something, anything that could help me. My hand brushed against something that rolled away in the darkness. I reached for it, and after a brief second, I found a thick stick that must have fallen in the hole and rolled down the tunnel. I grabbed the stick and held on to it for dear life, knowing that it was the only small bit of hope that I would find down here in the darkness. The creature was getting close. I wanted to start thrusting the stick at it, hoping to hit anything and stop it from its pursuit. But I knew these monsters were not easily deterred. I waited, hoping that luck would give me a brief glimpse of light so I could make my shot count. As the creature was almost upon me, a streak of moonlight came through and I saw where the creature's eyes were. Before it could move, and I lost my chance, I struck. With all the rage and adrenaline-induced force I could muster, I thrust the stick in the creature's eye. A loud, ear-piercing screech tore through the air and left my ears ringing and unable to hear anything else. I expected the creature to back up, to try to escape the tunnel, but it just lay there unmoving. I kicked it in the face with my good leg, but it was like kicking a sack of potatoes. The creature didn't flinch or acknowledge the strike. I pulled the stick and, after a brief bit of resistance, it pulled free. With the small slit of moonlight available, I was able to see that the monster's eye was impaled on the stick along with pink bits of brain matter. I looked toward the creature again and realized that I had killed it. Slowly, my heart was coming back and what was once the screaming of bloodthirsty creature was now a symphony of wails. They had sent a child in to catch what they assumed was easy prey, and the only thing returned to them was a dead child. I didn't know whether this would make their hatred for me even greater, or if they would be more wary of me now. It didn't matter. My adrenaline was spent. My ankle was either sprained or broken. My body was covered with cuts and scrapes, and burned like I had been skinned alive. Despite having drunk my fill at the tiny spring, I was still dehydrated, and I began to get woozy. The last thing I saw before losing consciousness was the lifeless body of the child monster in front of me, slowly being dragged backward out of the tunnel. I woke up with a pounding headache, and if it's possible, in even more pain than the night before. Sleeping in the confined space, 
twisted into an unnatural position to fit in the chamber hadn't done my injuries any good. I tried to shift position, and the dried blood all over my clothes from the scratches crackled like a thin layer of frost on the grass in the early hours of a fall morning. I shifted again, trying to move my legs, when I was overcome with agonizing pain. I had forgotten about my ankle. I was sure now that it was definitely broken. The air didn't reek of death like it would if the monsters were close. Did I dare try to find my way back to my cave of safety? I had followed a trail through the underbrush on my stomach ran for who knows how long in the dark, and then fell down an embankment right before reaching this place. Did I even have a chance of finding my cave before nightfall? The only thing I knew was that staying where I was wasn't going to help me. It might temporarily prevent my death, but there was no food, water, or way to signal for help from in here. I began to pull myself toward the mouth of the tunnel. This was a painfully slow process. I couldn't use my legs at all without debilitating pain shooting up from my ankles. Pulling myself up the tunnel scraped off the stabs on my stomach that had formed from where the underbrush had left thousands of tiny cuts across my body. Halfway to the entrance, I had to stop. The pain and exhaustion were just too much to handle. I needed a break. I didn't know if I could go on. I broke down and began to sob. I wish I could say that this unbridled show of emotion helped me somehow, that it cleared my mind or reduced my stress. It did nothing of the sort. The more I cried, the more I wanted to cry. At that moment, sobbing alone in the tunnel, broken and bleeding, I lost all hope. I knew I was going to die and nothing I could do was going to change it. My only decision now was to whether wait here in this tunnel for dehydration to take me or go out into the open and wait for a monster to tear me apart. Neither option was particularly appealing. Both were torturous and painful, but at least the creatures would make quick work of me. Dehydration could take days of suffering before I was put out of my misery. I would rather be ripped apart in a glorious burst of pain that suddenly ends than to suffer for days on end in the ever-increasing pain while my body slowly shuts down. With the last bit of resolve that my body had to give, I began my final journey out of the tunnel. Before my head broke out into the open, I smelled death once again. This was it. A creature was waiting for me, and my suffering would soon end. I was prepared for death and welcomed it. I made a final push and emerged from the tunnel. I lay there, waiting for my death, but nothing happened. After a brief second, I heard whimpering. With the energy I didn't know I had, I turned my head to see my friend staring at me in disbelief, crying at the sight of me. Relief washed over me as everything went dark. When I woke up, I was back in the cave that my friend and I had shared. My shirt was gone, replaced with a thick layer of a black and green mud that I can only assume was some type of medicine my friend had concocted on my behalf. My left ankle was protected by a sort of splint that she had created for me. There were straight sticks on either side of my ankle and behind it, tied with a sinewy substance with and caked with more of the black and green mud. After I assured myself that I was indeed alive, I gingerly tried to move. Although still very sore, the pain wasn't unbearable. My friend must have heard me because as soon as I moved, I heard her make I make the sound she used for my name, and she came and sat beside me. She placed her hand on my chest, signaling that she wanted me to lay back down. I obliged, and she began to gently prod at the different parts of my body, presumably to make sure that nothing else was broken. Satisfied that she had patched me up as much as possible, she helped me to sit up and offered me a strip of dried meat. The smell of it turned my stomach, and I began to dry heave. She immediately withdrew the food and brought me the canteen full of water. She must have tracked me and found the canteen. I had dropped while running away from the monsters. I drank thirstily and then sat there and stared at her. I still didn't understand how I had gotten caught up in this horrible game of cat and mouse, but 
I was glad I had a friend trying to protect me. She walked to the side of the cave and brought back the backpack. She opened it and withdrew a handful of berries and held them toward me, as if asking if I could handle them. I took a few, hesitant to eat anything, but knowing I needed to get my strength back up. After eating a few berries, I started to get my appetite back and ate even more berries. She watched me closely and after a few handfuls offered me the meat again. It reeked of rot and death. There was no way I was going to eat that. That when I remembered she had butchered and dried the meat from the monster that had come into the cave to kill me. Apparently, the rotten stench wasn't just a part of their outer aroma, it permeated through their meat as well. I pointed toward the pile of deer meat toward the back of the cave. She sat there for a second before understanding what I was trying to tell her. She got up quickly and grabbed some deer meat and brought it back. This smelled much better and I was easily able to finish my meal. When I was full, she helped me lay back down for a nap. When I woke back up, it was dark outside and she was standing at the mouth of the cave, staring into the darkness. I heard the familiar low growl emanating from her throat. This meant that danger was near, but not upon us. Even in my broken state, I knew I needed to do something. I tried to move, and pain shut up my leg and made me whimper. She turned quickly, concern flooding her face. I smiled at her to let her know that I was okay. Resolve flooded my body, and I fought through the pain and crawled to our fire pit. I couldn't do much, but I could at least start a fire. It proved very useful in our last fight. Perhaps it would this time as well. She was smart, although she couldn't figure out how to start a fire. She had set everything up exactly the way I had shown her. The only thing I needed was to strike the flint and coax the small spark into a flame. Soon enough, I had a fire going, and kept adding wood to it. The larger the flame got, the more secure I felt. The drone of low growling soon turned to a murderous, snarling growl. I knew that it was time. The fight had once again come to us. I sat there, in terror, as a terrifying blur of fur and stench shot into the cave. It was headed right for me, but she was faster. She jumped on top of the monster's back, and without hesitating, I grabbed a flaming stick and jammed it into the monster's face. It screamed and stumbled backward. My ally jumped down, catching the monster off guard, threw it to the ground. She grabbed a boulder and smashed his head in. We had survived again, but this time she didn't relax. She didn't try to skin him or take his head off. She resumed her position at the mouth of the cave. Now I knew the monsters weren't scared of me because I had killed one of their own. They were enraged that I had killed one of their children. They weren't concerned that she had killed two of their own in just a few short days. They had decided to end it once and for all by sending in all of the troops. We were going to die that night. She began snarling again. This time, instead of a rush of fur and teeth, I heard the crack of sticks a long scream falling away and a thud. My trap had worked. One of the creatures had walked off the precarious ledge and onto the thin sticks I had disguised as part of the ledge. Two down, but how many more to go? She rushed to me and grabbed a flaming stick, ran to the mouth of the cave. In my exhausted, half-delirious state, I had failed to see that she had created a series of fire pits at the mouth of the cave, each set up with sticks and kindling, ready for a fire. She plunged the stick into the first of the fire pits, and a fire started. Seeing what she was doing, I grabbed sticks myself and crawled to the front of the cave to get the rest of the fires going. The fires were small. It would take time for them to grow large, but at least it was something. She growled, and I looked where she was looking. A monster walked out of the dark and onto the ledge in front of our cave opening. Although the fires were weak, he seemed to be tentative to cross them. He stood there, staring at us murderously, but not moving. He was soon joined by another monster, equally as terrifying as the first. Before long, the entire front of the cave was filled with these monsters, unwilling to cross the wall of fire and equally unwilling to leave their quarry. 
there were at least nine of these horrendous monsters staring at us waiting on the fire to die down so they could tear into us and eat our flesh we had more firewood but not an indefinite supply i looked at my fellow prisoner and saw that she too realized the situation we were in we had postponed our deaths but there was no way we could win a fight against this many monsters and in the end we would either have to fight our way out or die i stared at the monsters i stared at the fires i wondered how long we had before it was all over i then noticed something a piece of paracord hanging down from the mouth of the cave that's when i remembered the booby trap i had set up i tried to stand but the pain in my ankle was too great i crumpled back to the floor with a cry of pain she turned to me wondering what i was trying to do i pointed to the paracord and signaled that it needed to be pulled she looked at me quizzically and i signaled again pretending to reach toward the cord and pull it myself she cocked her head pointed to the paracord and made a motion as if she was pulling it down i shook my head she took one last look at me and then at the monsters in front of us and walked toward the paracord it was directly over a fire she couldn't reach it without burning herself she looked back at me almost pleading with her eyes wanting to be sure that she really needed to do this i smiled sadly and shook my head without any more hesitation she jumped forward and grabbed the paracord and yanked it hard landing directly in the fire she yelped and rolled backward into the cave at the same time i could hear the sound of sliding rock followed by the bumping of logs hitting each other in a split second logs began to fall on the heads of these creatures in the confusion some stepped backward into the empty space and fell to their deaths others were thrown across the edge of the cliff the force of the logs hitting them a few fell straight down after being hit on the head by the logs dazed but still very much alive my friend seeing what had happened quickly grabbed a boulder and smashed in the heads of those still at the mouth of the cave and then threw them over the cliff with the bodies of the others after calming down from the attack she grabbed a large portion of a tree stump in the back of the cave that i hadn't noticed before its hollow interior was filled with the same strange black and green mud-like substance that she had smeared all over me she carefully smeared a thick layer over her burns and smiled at me seemingly happy with the booby trap i had made that had kept us alive feeling much safer after killing so many monsters we lay down to a fitful sleep my dreams were filled with monsters waiting to devour me i'm sure her dreams were much the same as her tossing and turning woke me up many times throughout the night when i woke up i couldn't believe how much better i felt the only pain i felt was in my ankle but it was a dull pain compared to the sharp stabbing pain i had felt the day before she was still asleep and it seemed best to let her rest i had no idea how much rest she had gotten since the night she had brought me to this cave but i knew that i needed her at her best if i was going to survive this i sat there not wanting to move for fear of waking her and tried to figure out a way out of this the only way i could think of surviving was to leave to find my way back to my car and go home where the monsters didn't exist i had to convince her to help me or i was doomed after the fight last night we were either in the clear having killed the entire army out there waiting to kill us or we had just angered them and they were going to overwhelm us at the next opportunity i was pretty sure that there were more out there which meant we were in real trouble she woke up and looked at me i could tell that even though she was relieved to see that it wasn't a dream i had indeed survived the night there was a sadness in her eyes she already knew what i had deduced we weren't going to survive much longer i crawled to the edge of the closest fire pit and pulled out a piece of charcoal i then crawled to the cave wall and used the charcoal to draw a crude shape of a car i pointed to myself and then to the car she seemed to get almost angry and shook her head no why didn't she want to take me back to my car i pointed again more insistently this time and she responded with an even more insistent no if i couldn't convince her to take me back to my car i was dead my life was going to be blotted out like it meant nothing 
if I couldn't convince the subhuman species to just take me back to my stupid car. What was her problem? A thought dawned on me. She wanted to protect me. Why? I had no idea. But I did know that she would lay down her life for mine if that's what it took. I had to convince her that it was the only option. I pointed to the back of the cave toward the cavern that held all the dead bodies. She stared at me unmoving. I pointed to myself and laid back and closed my eyes in the best imitation of death I could remember. She let out a sorrowful moan, and when I opened my eyes, I saw a tear forming in the corner of her eye. She didn't want me to die. Maybe she understood that I was saying that it was going to be my fate. I pointed again to the drawing of the car and myself and then smiled, trying beyond all hope to put her at ease and let her know that this is what needed to happen. She hung her head in resolution. I wasn't sure if she was going to do it, but then she stood up and grabbed the backpack. She filled it with dry meat and berries, then came over to me. She gently picked me up and we walked outside of the cave. I was filled with hope but also terror and dread. I had no idea where we were, how far we were away from my car, or if we had any hope of getting there before nightfall, when the monster seemed to be most active. Once off the cliff and back in the woods, she started to run, not a jog or paced run, but a full-on dead sprint. We must be extremely far away from my car. I could only hope that she would be able to carry me the backpack and keep this pace the whole way. She ran for hours before stopping at a creek to drink some water and eat a few berries. Before I had even had a chance to make a meal of it, she snatched me back up and started back at the unrelenting pace. Her body was covered in sweat that had long ago frothed into a foam. Her chest heaved hard with each breath. And I was concerned about her ability to keep going, but her pace never slowed. Just before the sun went down, we stopped once more for water, but this time she didn't take the time to eat any berries. She simply stopped, placed me beside the water, took a few drinks while I did the same, then scooped me up and continued on her way. I was terrified that the sun was setting and we weren't at my car yet. At the same time, everything looked familiar. The last water break looked very familiar. I wanted to say it was the place that I had stopped for the night before this terrible ordeal had began. But I was exhausted, terrified, and couldn't trust my senses. I soon heard the knocking of wood on wood. It was happening again. We were being chased, but this time we didn't have the satisfaction of a cave to run to. We were on our own. In the open, with no tricks up our sleeves, Try as she might, to keep up her pace, she was slowing. She had been running at full speed for hours. I'm surprised it took this long for her exhaustion to prevent her from keeping up her speed. Still, of all the times of getting tired, this was not it. The sound of wood on wood were getting louder, and I could now make out the whoops of monsters happily chasing their prey. This sound gave my friend one last burst of adrenaline, and she took off at full speed once more. The monsters were getting closer and closer. Soon, it would all be over. We burst into a clearing, and there was a road. I knew where we were. I looked to my right, and in the moonlight, I could see my car. She set me down, and I hobbled to my car. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. I reached into my pockets to grab the keys. Where were the keys? How stupid could I be? I had asked her to run all the way out here. Sure, that this was my only salvation and I hadn't even taken the time to see if I still had the keys. They were probably back at my campsite with my backpack. Now I was going to die. I had no place to hide, no defensible position, and I was going to be surrounded by angry monsters intent on my destruction. I was angry at myself. How could I be so stupid? What was going to happen to her? Would they tear her apart too because of my ill-formed plan? An intense sadness like I've never felt before washed over me, and I fell to the ground beside my car and started crying, not for myself, but for putting her in that kind of danger. She ran over to me and motioned for me to get in the car. I didn't know how to tell her. I couldn't, so I just sat there. Frustrated, she broke the car window and pointed to it, telling me to get in. 
I still just sat there, knowing that I couldn't start it without the keys, and I didn't know how to hotwire it. She jerked her head up, as if listening, then, angrily picking me up, carried me to the road, and sat me down, and placed the backpack in my lap, and took off running in the opposite direction. I heard her howling, probably trying to draw the attention away from me and toward herself. It seemed to have worked. The sound of our pursuers seemed to follow in her direction, instead of continuing on in mine. Within just a few seconds, I realized why she placed me in the middle of the road. What I couldn't hear what she could. A vehicle was coming. I wanted to stand up, to flag it down, to make sure I wasn't hit, but I couldn't move. I sat there and hoped beyond hope that it would see me in time to stop. As the headlights hit me, I heard the screech of brakes, and the truck moved to the side of the road. A man cautiously walked over to me and asked if I was okay. I turned my head to warn him and told him I needed help and we needed to get out of there now. He seemed a bit perplexed but helped me up, put my backpack in the bed of the truck and helped me into the cab. He climbed into the passenger seat and took a long look at me. I don't know what happened to you, but you're going to the hospital right now. I didn't even reply. I just closed my eyes and passed out from a mix of exhaustion and relief. I woke up in a hospital bed with a cast on my leg and IV tubes coming out of my arm. I had a few bandages here and there, but all in all, it wasn't too bad. They had cleaned me up pretty well. All of the mud was gone and I was in a clean hospital gown, in a clean bed, and I had a cup of cool, clean water on the table next to me. I reached over and took a few big swigs and went back to sleep. I woke up again a few hours later when a nurse came in to check on me. She smiled and mentioned that they had been waiting for me to wake up. She said she was going to get the doctor and they'd be right back. The doctor came in and told me that I had a broken ankle, but other than that, I was fine. A bit dehydrated and obviously exhausted, but fine. They wanted to know how I ended up like that out in the middle of the road, covered in that strange, dried mud and beat up. Without thinking, I started to tell them the whole story about the monsters, about my friend protecting me, about our terrifying journey back to my car. The doctor just smiled and after a while told me someone would be back to finish listening to my story. A few hours later, a different doctor came in and listened to my story. I saw him conversing in the hallway with my first doctor and a few other people in doctor's coats that I didn't know. Another doctor came in and started asking me questions like where I lived, who was the president, and what year it was. Then they started asking me questions about my beliefs and things like that. My parents showed up, concerned and wanting to know what had happened to me. Before I could tell them, the doctor pulled them to the side and whispered with them for a while. He left and my parents came back over to me. They explained to me that the doctor thinks I must have been hallucinating. I seem to be very grounded with a good understanding of reality, except for the preceding week's event. They asked me if I had deliberately gone into the woods to do drugs or if I had perhaps gotten lost and accidentally ate something I found that caused me to hallucinate. Try as they might, I couldn't convince them that it was the truth. They told me that I needed to understand what I believed happened was just a hallucination, or I might have to stay in the hospital longer for more intensive psychotherapy. I wanted to get back to my life as normal. I was tired of sitting in the hospital bed. I decided to pretend as though I believed them that I had hallucinated. I told them that I had gotten lost that first evening, and when I ran out of food, grabbed some mushrooms from the forest that I was sure were good to eat, but maybe one of them wasn't. That seemed to make them happy, and they let me go home, but I know the truth. I know what's out there. I know that I was on the verge of death the entire time I was there. I know why so many people go missing at Bluff Creek, and it's not because they lose the trail. They are hunted by monsters, clever, crafty monsters, with a penchant for human flesh. She can only protect so many. Try as she might, I think I'm the only one she's actually been able to save. I don't even know if she's still alive to try to save anyone else. Please, don't go to the forest at Bluff Creek. 
This isn't a joke. It's not some story I came up with for fun. It's real. And it's terrifying. You won't survive. I was lucky at every turn, and I still barely made it. You have been warned. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!